morning. Um, the title for today's talk is The Devotion to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Rosary. When I was asked to give this talk, so I came up with um, three um, topics, and I was wondering which one should go in order. And then um, when I prayed about it, I was inspired to start with this topic that we're going to go into now. I've always made the claim that the Catholic Church has one of the most beautiful, beautiful teachings on the Holy Spirit. But when it comes to having an experience with the Holy Spirit, I don't think we do well. I'm talking about experiential knowledge. A knowledge that we come to know person, a person because we have a relationship with this person. So the Holy Spirit, in the sense, has become the forgotten person of the Blessed Trinity. And we know without the Holy Spirit, we can't have the sacrifice of the Mass. Without the Holy Spirit, we can't have Jesus. Without the Holy Spirit, the church would not exist. Without the Holy Spirit, even the world would not have been created. So, that is why the charismatic movement in the Catholic Church is helping us to delve more into relationship with the Holy Spirit. Before I, before I continue, I want, you to introduce, I want to introduce you to um, a holy woman, a mystic, that most Catholics haven't heard. Her name is Conchita Cabrera. She lived in the 18th century. She was born in 1862 and died in 1937. She lived her whole life in Mexico. She was a laywoman, married, mother of nine children. Conchita was chosen by the Lord as an instrument to communicate the spirituality of the cross and to establish the work of the cross. Her religious writings and meditations total over 60,000 handwriting pages. In her writings, she revealed a deep mysticism that rivals St. Catherine of Siena and St. Teresa of Avila. Blessed, Blessed Pope John Paul II, the Great, declared her venerable on December the 20th, 1999. And she is currently in the, in the process of beatification. So here, at these revelations, are made by the Lord to Conchita on the Holy Spirit and the second Pentecost and the era of the Holy Spirit in her book contained, it's all, it's all contained in her book, A Mother's Spiritual Diary. I will urge you to read it. It is really, really, really spiritually deep. Jesus said this to, to Conchita. This Holy Spirit is he who governs the world and the church after I departed. After the ascension, I sent him. Yet if you only knew how little he is honored and how little known, there are hardly any temples in his honor. He is undervalued and little thought of. of. He is not given the glory he merits as a divine person. For many Christians, the Holy Spirit is not appreciated. He is not known. He is not thanked for his perpetually sanctifying action. But the world is ungrateful to me. How much more towards the Holy Spirit? And very often, when we pray to the Holy Spirit, we relate to him as if he is some kind of vague Spirit, some kind of impersonal spirit, as if it's a force. The Holy Spirit is God. 
He shares the same um, um, nature with the other two persons of the Blessed Trinity, the Father and the Son. And Jesus continues, The world of souls itself does not know him as it should. He is the light of the intellect and the fire which enkindles the heart. If there is indifference, coldness, weakness, and so many other evils which afflict the spiritual world, and even my church, it is because recourse is not had to the Holy Spirit. With the moral mess we are in now, in the world, and even in the church, Jesus is basically telling us we should turn to the Holy Spirit and ask for his graces and ask for his help to conform ourselves into the image and likeness of Christ. Jesus again reveals to Conchita, if there is sadness, and we all know the world is in a sad state, it is because recourse is not had to this divine cons- uh, consoler, to him who is perfect spiritual joy. Joy, as we know, is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. If there is weakness, it is not because there is no reliance on him who is invisible might. Fortitude, the gift of the Holy Spirit, fortifies us to be soldiers of Christ. If there are errors, it is because of disregard for him who is light. Faith is extinguished through the absence of the Holy Spirit. In each heart and in the whole church, that is not rendered the Holy Spirit that which is due to him. Most of the evils that are deplored in the church and in the field of souls comes from not according to the Holy Spirit, the primacy which I have given to the third person of the Blessed Trinity who has taken so active a part in the incarnation of the word and in the founding of the church. He is loved Look warmly, invoked without favor, and in many hearts, even among my own, not even called to mine. All this deeply wounds my heart. As we know, even Jesus, who is the second person of the Blessed Trinity, when the Father sent him to take our human form, to take our flesh, to redeem us, the Holy Spirit was sent to the Blessed Virgin Mary and with her and with her consent the incarnation took place in her womb. Then also when Jesus Christ grew up at the age of 30 when he began to um, embark on his father's plan to evangelize the world and to, uh, to redeem the world after his baptism we are told the Holy Spirit pushed him into the desert so that he could train, he could prepare himself in some kind of spiritual training before he can engage the world. And when Jesus Christ died and went and ascended into heaven, before he founded the church, he sent the Holy Spirit to found the church. And thus, the Holy Spirit fortified the apostles, wimpy men who had, who had lived with Christ for three years, were scared, but now turned into men of favor, men, great men who would speak the truth without any fear. Nowadays, I think our Blessed Mother is appearing all over the, all over the world because the leaders of the church are not really, really doing the job as the great saints used to do. We are not preaching the truth as the great saints used to do. And now our Blessed Mother, because of her, her children, she's concerned of the, of the salvation of her children, is appearing around the world crying and weeping, asking us to return to God. It is time that the Holy Spirit reigns, Christ said. To the extent that the Holy Spirit will reign, sensuality, which today invades the earth, will disappear. 
Some souls think that the Holy Spirit is very far away, far, far up above. Actually, he is. He is, actually, he is, we might say, the divine person who is most closely present to the creature. How often do we pray, especially when we pray the rosary, that perfect rosary, that perfect prayer next to the sacrifice of the Holy Mass? When we pray, where, where is our eyes? Do we look to heaven? Do we look around us? Are we distracted? Say, oh God, are you listening to me? Are you actually present? But if we realize that this body we possess is a temple of the Holy Spirit, that the Blessed Trinity dwells within us, St. Teresa of Avila herself, St. Teresa of Avila, the doctor of the church, the reformer of the Carmelite order, when she was struggling to pray, finally realized that you know, I don't have to look outside. I don't have to go look for images to pray. The Blessed Trinity lives within me. We have to go inside and have this communion with the Holy Spirit. And when we have communion with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit begins to groan, as Paul would tell us, begins to pray within us, begins to form us into the image and likeness of Christ. Jesus again tells Conchita, if you invoke the Father... If you love him, it is through the Holy Spirit. If you love me ardently, if you know me, if you serve me, if you imitate me, if you make yourself but one with my wishes and my heart, it is through the Holy Spirit. So in a sense, before we pick up the rosary to pray, we have to invoke the Holy Spirit to ask him to pray within us to dispose us to prayer, to, consecrate our, to concentrate our minds and heart to God. Another person I want to introduce, his name is Luis Martinez. He was the Archbishop of Mexico and a mystic himself, a philosopher and a theologian, a poet and a director of souls. Actually, he was Conchita's spiritual director for the last 12 years of her life. It's amazing how divine providence always raises souls throughout history. So it's always um, kindred spirits. You, know, like, um, you have John of the Cross, you have um, Kat, um, uh, Teresa of Avila, St. Francis, St. Clair. Um, some of these great saints always have like, the male and female um, 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 uh, friends that God raises. He, he wrote, I think, what in my opinion, one of the best books on the Holy Spirit. It is called True Devotion to the Holy Spirit. Most books on the Holy Spirit you read, you read from Catholic authors are good, but most of the time when the write is too dry, it doesn't actually inspire you to want to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. They tell you about what the Holy Spirit does, but they, they don't actually tell you how to pray in the Holy Spirit, and how the Holy Spirit works within us. In his classic work, again, on the Holy Spirit, True Devotion to the Holy Spirit, Archbishop Luis Martinez shows you how and why your devotion to the Holy Spirit should be profound and encompassing. He said, the Holy Spirit is more forgotten he must be given his proper place, the place that rightfully belongs to him in Christian life and Christian perfection. There I, want to, I want to quote from the second letter to the Corinthians when Paul teaches us that, do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? In a sense, he is telling us that the Christian life is the reproduction of Jesus Christ in souls and perfection, the most faithful and perfect reproduction consists in the transformation of souls into Jesus. One of the main reasons that the Holy Spirit was sent to the church was not just to found the church or to form apostles, but more importantly, was to transform us 
into the image and likeness of Christ. He makes us like Jesus by transforming us into him. This is his work. Nobody can be conformed to Jesus except in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, some souls are destined to reproduce the infant of the crib with the childlike virtues. Others, like Jesus of Nazareth, silent and contemplative, still others, the apostle and master who teaches and comforts, consoles, and saves. Then there are those who are to reproduce Jesus transfigured with love. Jesus of the tabernacle, loving in silence and mystically offering himself in sacrifice. Those two who are to reproduce um, Jesus' agony of Gethsemane and others, the bloody sacrifice of Calvary. So, one of the beautiful things about the rosary is that we meditate different aspects of Christ's life. And very often, the Holy Spirit inspires us to imitate aspects of his life. For example, um, I mentioned here the infant of the crib with the child, childlike virtues. Who does that remind you of? St. Therese of Lisieux. Another good example, Jesus in Gethsemane. Who does that um, uh, remind you of? Um, Blessed Mother Teresa. Where she spent more than 30 years in, in uh, what we call the dark night of the spirit. She felt abandoned and lonely. The Holy Spirit invited her to relieve that aspect of Christ's life. Then we have our Holy Father Francis, also called to share the passion of Christ, and thus he had the five wounds of Christ. Each one of us, when we pick up the rosary, we should be attentive to how the Holy Spirit is inviting us to mimic or to imitate or to actually relieve an aspect of Christ's life. So how does the Holy Spirit transform us into Christ? First, we have to realize that he lives within us. Archbishop Martinez calls him the delightful guest. And if we realize that he's a guest, who is there to stay unless we commit mortal sins and drive him away? But he is there forever. If we realize that when we start practicing what we call doing what we call the practicing of the presence of God. The Holy Spirit does not come to us in a transitory manner. He established in in us his permanent dwelling and lives in intimate union with our souls as their eternal guest. Jesus promised that this to us, Jesus promised this to us on the last night of his mortal life. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to dwell with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you shall know him because he will dwell with you and be in you. How often do we pray and remind ourselves that the Holy Spirit is within us? Yes, we are so Christocentric. It's not like the It's not like the persons of the Blessed Trinity are kind of like jealous of each other. No. But Christ is basically telling us that he sent the Holy Spirit as an advocate so that through him we can know his mind. Through him we can act like Christ. Through him we can love like God. If the Holy Spirit dwells within us, then... He becomes our supreme director, or what we call the director of souls. He becomes our intimate teacher, and he becomes the soul of our spiritual life. The soul's delightful guest does not remain idle in his intimate sanctuary, Archbishop um, Martinez tells us. Being, as the church calls him, fire and light, he hardly takes possession of the soul because of, his great inf- because of his influence 
he extends itself to the whole being and begins with divine activity and works his work, it's a divine activity by transforming us into the image and likeness of Christ. This intimate master and divine director of souls, in the same one Jesus taught in his discourse at the Last Supper, the Holy Spirit that the Father will send in my name will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. So, in the sense, we have, again, we have scriptures. Scriptures was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And if you truly want to know the mind of Christ, if you truly want to act like Christ, up, go to scriptures, the word of God. Most of us just pick, up, just pick the word of God and start reading it as if it's like any other textbook. No, the word of God must be read through with the mind of Christ, with the heart of Christ. If we are to do it, we, are, we have to invoke the Holy Spirit to open our minds to understand what Christ is revealing to us. To open our hearts so that Christ can infuse his love in our heart so we could love God and love our neighbor. The Holy Spirit teaches everything by communicating a new light, a divine light to the intelligence. That's why we're intellectual beings. We're intellectual beings because we're created in God's image. Animals are not intellectual beings. Human beings are. And if we're intellectual beings and we're supposed to relate to God, then we have to relate to God in his way. And by relating to God in his way is to invoke the Holy Spirit to teach us how to do that. The Holy Spirit teaches us by pouring himself into us gently. He teaches us as, as mothers teach their children with kisses of love, with an indef indefinable outpouring of tenderness. Though he, comes as though he did come as fire during the Pentecost, in our soul, he's gentle with us because he knows we're very slow to learn. He knows if he comes with all his power, he might destroy us. But before he comes, he's very gentle, like a, br like a, like a breeze and like a soft wind to attract us so that we could seek, seek what is good and seek what is holy. And if the Holy Spirit again dwells within us, he begins to act in our soul as an artist. That's why Archbishop Martinez calls him the artist of souls. That which a human artist dreams of without ever being able to attain, the divine artist accomplishes because he is perfect and infinite. His action is intimate and constant. He enters into the depths of the soul, penetrates it, penetrates the, in, the innermost recesses, take up his permanent dwelling there to produce later on his magnificent work, transform, transforming us into Christ. Without the dwelling of the Holy Spirit in us, we cannot become Christ. Whoever does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him, says Paul in Romans. So, a few, so, so in a sense, the rosary, when we pray the rosary, is basically the summation of the gospel. That's why I tell people, if you, can't, if you don't read scriptures, you will not appreciate the prayer of the rosary. It is the word of God. And the rosary, we meditate on the word made flesh. So to the degree you ponder the rosary, to the degree you are attracted to read scriptures, to know the mind of Christ and to imitate him. And to the degree you imitate Christ and tr through reading the scriptures, that is going to help you in your meditation as you ponder on the mysteries of Christ in the rosary. But again, we have to invoke again the Holy Spirit to really immerse herself into scriptures. As the divine artist, the Holy Spirit, the, 
though he reproduces, he, he can reproduce us by himself because he's God. He doesn't need any human in, um, agency. However, he chooses, he has chosen to reproduce Christ in us with our blessed mother. It is unfortunate that, the Christ, that Christians do not often enough ponder the relationship between Mary and the Holy Spirit. Thank God, now more and more Catholics are now involved in the charismatic movement. They're helping the church to begin to understand this relationship between Mary and the Holy Spirit. There used to be a tendency just to focus on the Holy Spirit and then not actually including Mary in their devotion to the Holy Spirit. That is changing. In the Gospel of Luke, when Mary asked the angel how it could be that she would, be, that she would bear a son since she was a virgin, the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy Son of God. Mary's relationship to the Holy Spirit is necessary to bring about the birth of Christ in our soul. Not physical birth, but it's a spiritual birth. When we read the power of the Holy Spirit will overshadow you, we see in this passage a reference connecting various Old Testament and apocalyptic um, scriptures. For example, in the Exodus 24, we read that the cloud covered the mountain where God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, and his glory settled on Sinai. The cloud was covered. The, cl- the cloud was, came and covered the tent of meeting, and no one was able to enter because the glory of God filled the tabernacle. Similarly, in First Kings, when the priest had dedicated the, the new temple, the cloud again filled the temple and no one was able to enter. Mary thus becomes the new temple. At the Annunciation, when the angel asked her to become the mother of God, and when she said yes, the Holy Spirit came up upon her, overshadowed her, and thus she became a living temple. So most, very often, when I, when, I, when, I, when I pray before the tabernacle, I always picture the tabernacle as Mary. Mary bearing Christ in her womb. She is a living tabernacle. And if we, if we begin to realize that, then our experience praying the rosary before the blessed sacrament will be so rich. It will be so alive. The word overshadow in Luke chapter 1, implies cloud, and thus suggests that Mary, like the temple, tent, house, or tabernacle of the old covenant, becomes the dwelling place of God, signaling the beginning of the new covenant. We can see from this overshadowing by God that Mary became the chosen temple of God and that the glory of God filled her such that Mary was able to say, the mighty one has done great things for me. And holy is his name. Most people think they can just go to Jesus without going through Mary. Should we? Yes. Is it wrong? No. But if you truly want to know the Son, if you truly want to be humble, if you truly want to love God, if you truly want to grow in the knowledge, understanding, of God, it's, it's just, it is very, very fitting that you go through Mother Mary because no one knows the son better than the mother. The mother knows the son very well and, that, and she, realizes that she realizes that her vocation is to point God's children to Jesus not to herself. When she is praised, she, takes, she receives the praise and offers it to the person who created her 
immaculately because she knows everything she has, everything she does, she does it through the power of the Holy Spirit. A second implication of God's overshadowing of Mary is its symbolic connection to a husband overshadowing his wife to consummate the marriage. Again, the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary should certainly not be understood as a physical action, but a spiritual act. This couples with the implication of the scriptures as First King, chapter 8, in which no one was able to enter the tabernacle when the cloud of God was present, indicates that Mary, too, could, be, could belong to no other person but to God alone. So you begin to see how the Old Testament begins to unveil who this beautiful woman is. Thus, the great saints will begin to identify Mary as the spouse of the Holy Spirit. The overshadowing of Mary by the Most High also reminds us of the Spirit hovering over the waters of Genesis 1 prior to the creation. In Mary's case, God was creating a home for himself in the womb of Mary, a human body, Emmanuel, which means God dwells with us. This work of creation by God in Genesis ended with the creation of man, the first Adam. The move of the spirit over Mary ended with the creation of the body of the new Adam, Jesus, God in flesh. Mary being overshadowing by the Most High results with the conception of Jesus, the God-man. In this, the Holy Spirit consummates the union of him and Mary. He becomes the spouse of the Holy Spirit. So in Genesis, God breathed. The world was created, formed man, took the soil and formed man in his image. So Mary is likened to the earth in which the Holy Spirit used the earth, in a sense, to produce the first, uh, the first man. And that is why some of the, uh, the, saint, the greatest saints will say, Mary's greatest virtue, though she was a virgin, immaculate conceived, her greatest virtue, a, a virtue was humility, where we get the word humus. But she was so humble, she was so open, she was so obedient that she could not resist the Holy Spirit from possessing her totally in order to produce Jesus Christ in her womb. So when we pray the rosary, we can ask our Blessed Mother. That's what I always do, especially when I pray the, um, um, the, the first joyful mystery, the Annunciation. I always ask her to give me her humility, to teach me how to open myself to the Holy Spirit, so that Christ can be born in my, in my, in my heart. And also as a, good, as a Dominican, or as, as uh, the Mendican order were called to go out and preach the gospel, what an example that Mary gives us. She receives the word, and the word be- became flesh, and what does she do? The first thing she does was go to Elizabeth to go and evangelize. Don't you do the same thing at Mass? How often are we open when we go to Mass? How humble are we to receive Christ in our hearts so that Christ can transform us into, him, into himself and lead us to go and evangelize the word of God? But today, I will have to say the humility is lacking. I can say this as a priest because the confessional lines are very small. If, if the confessional lines begins to fill up, which we're beginning to see signs of it, that means people are beginning to get it. They're beginning to listen to the Holy Spirit because it's only humility that leads you to confession. And when you go to confession, you acknowledge your littleness, you acknowledge your sinfulness. And then when you acknowledge your sinfulness, because you have to realize God doesn't need our power. He doesn't need our strength. He doesn't need our perfection. He is all that. But what he needs is what he cannot have. Our limitation. Our weaknesses. 
that he glorifies himself through our humility. The sanctification of John the Baptist was the first fruit of Christ's redemption. This came about through the Savior's mother, the Virgin Mary, and the sound of her voice. Here we see the proof of Mary's share of redemption. It was Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that performed the miracle and sanctified his yet unborn precursor, but this he accomplished through his mother's instrumentality, through her greeting. Now, you begin to see that when you have devotion to Mary, what happens? The second person of the Blessed Trinity acts. And the third person of the Blessed Trinity also acts. Because as soon as, as, soon as the Annunciation took place, upon hearing that her cousin Elizabeth was pregnant, Mary was consumed with such charity she ran to go and help her cousin with her pregnancy. And we're told as soon as Elizabeth heard her voice, what happened? She was filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, the word made flesh in her, confirmed John, his precursor, sanctified John in his mother's womb. So when we pray the rosary, we are not just praying to God through, our, through, um, through Mother Mary. But we're realizing that when we give ourselves to Mary, she brings, she comes with her, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. If we realize this truth, then, we, then our life will be so Christ-like. And we realize that Mary's devotion to Mary is devotion to the Blessed Trinity. Even at the Pentecost, I, should, I, will, we shall, I will mention it um, earlier on, later on, she needed to be there to help the apostles, to dispose them to receive the Holy Spirit because she herself experienced that. At hearing Mary's greeting, her cousin Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Elizabeth said to the Virgin and under divine inspiration loudly, proclaimed the sublime dignity of Mary by calling her the mother of my Lord. Look at the history of the church, the founders of religious orders, some of the prophets who have had in the church. They all had devotion to Mary. So when you have devotion to Mary and her presence, and you are in her presence, you become a prophet in in some way. Just as Elizabeth, in Mary's presence, she identified, because she too was open, who Mary was. She realized Mary was the mother of God. And she uttered this prophetic word. That is why the mother of my God and declared her more blessed and more holier than any woman. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of of your womb. Who told her? It was the Holy Spirit. And when did this happen? When she heard Mary's voice. Not God's voice, but Mary's voice. This is reminiscence of of Numbers, that's the, uh, the Old Testament book. Numbers 11, when the cloud was over the tent of meeting and the 72 elders received some of the Spirit of God some, some uh, received some of the spirit God had given to Moses. In this case, it is Elizabeth who receives the spirit and prophesies. It also indicates the spirit was still overshadowed, overshadowing Mary like the cloud over the tent of Miriam. Significantly, Luke, that's the gospel of Luke, in his gospel, Luke places Mary among the disciples praying for the promised paraclete after the ascension of Jesus. All, it is said, all these devoted themselves with one accord to prayer, together with some women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. When we consider how rarely Mary is mentioned in the scriptures, we can appreciate that 
that how mentioned here in the upper room is in some way essential to the good news. Remember, Mary was the only one of the disciples already filled with the Holy Spirit. She was the first one in a sense who experienced the first Pentecost. Often of the talk, talk to, um, um, there was this story where before I joined the Dominican Order, I I, was, I, I, was, uh, I used to watch um, um, tapes that, uh, from Marian conferences. And in one of these tapes was a story that really touched me. And I, loved, I always love to share this story when I talk about Mary and the Rosary. He was a Catholic priest. And he, and, and he, and he had a very, very powerful, powerful um, healing ministry. So he was very charismatic in a sense. But he, often, he always realized that something was lacking in his spirituality, that something was lacking in his healing ministry. He could not put his finger on it. Then one day, after he had finished his, um, uh, his uh, healing, healing mass, there was, always takes an old lady to really put some sense into some of us priests. This old lady came and said, Father, I know you know something's lacking in your ministry. He says, yeah, how do you know? He said, that's not important. He says, okay, what do you mean by that? He says, Father, you love the Holy Spirit, right? He says, yes. And you are very Pentecostal, right? Yeah. Don't you see something's lacking? He says, um, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't think so. He says, okay, Father, you know scriptures better than I do. Let us go back to the, to the first Pentecostal experience of the church. Who was there? He says, oh, the Blessed Virgin Mary was there. He says, Father, does the Blessed Virgin Mary play a role in your life? Then he realized that to have an authentic Pentecostal experience, God deemed it necessary that Mary must should have should have, should have been there. Because usually, you know, when um, parents and, and and children and sons, usually the parents always go ahead before the son follows during death. But in this case, it's the son that went ahead, the mother, leaving the mother, and the apostles. Just imagine, put yourself, put yourself in the place of the apostles. If you were with Mother Mary in the upper room, preparing to receive the Holy Spirit, what would you have asked her? Wouldn't you have said, how, was, how did it feel carrying baby Jesus in your hands? How did it feel living with him for 13 years? What was he teaching you? How does it even feel to raise God in your home? The reason I ask this question is the same reason why the rosary is so important. Because when we pray the rosary, we are praying with the most, most powerful creature God ever created. When we pray the rosary, we pray with someone who knew, knew Jesus more intimately than all the angels, than any human being. So when we pray the rosary, Mary, if the Holy Spirit is our divine teacher, Mary is our human teacher. Through her, she teaches us who Jesus is. Through her, she can teach us how to cultivate the virtues of Christ. Through her, she can teach us more about the sacraments, the Eucharist. Through her, we can grow in the knowledge of God. And more important, through her, 
She can teach us how to dispose ourselves to receive the Holy Spirit before we start praying. One of, my, one, one of our lot of favorite saints, the one, of, one of them is St. Philip Neri. He's called the vessel of the Holy Spirit. Over a period of 10 years, while St. Philip Neri was in his 20s and still a layman, he used to spend many nights in prayer, either on the porticos of, Rome churches, of the Roman churches or on the catacombs the underground burial places of the martyrs outside the walls of the city. Very often, he always, before he started, says, Holy Spirit, fill me, dear Lord. Holy Spirit, please, just consume me. Sometimes what you ask from God can come true. On the vigil of the Pentecost in 1554, St. Philip was praying the catacombs of St. Sebastian, on the via appear as he had done many times and asking God to give him the Holy Spirit. As night passed, St. Philip was suddenly filled with great joy and had a vision of the Holy Spirit who appeared to him as a ball of fire. This fire entered into Philip's mouth and descended into his heart, causing it to expand to twice its normal size, and breaking two of his ribs in the process. He said that it filled the whole body with such joy and consolation that he finally had to throw himself on the ground and cry, no more, Lord, no more. um, um, Saint, uh, what's her name? Magdalena de Parsi, I think that's her name, the Augustinian mystic was so so filled and consumed with the Holy Spirit and she would say, please, if you don't stop, I will die. If these saints just had a taste of the Holy Spirit, then imagine who Mary is. God took flesh in her womb. The Holy Spirit sometimes manifested himself to St. Philip Neri in extraordinary ways when St. Philip Neri heard confessions and gave spiritual directions. The penitents would hear the beating of the saint's heart and feel, and feel heat emanating from his body. The physical revelations of this presence of the Holy Spirit, people sensed it around him. And it says during winter, the Holy Spirit would consume him and he would just go and throw himself on the snow. I says, Lord, please just stop it. And all these saints had one thing in common. They had devotion to our Blessed Mother. And thus, our Blessed Mother is called the Queen of the Apostles. She encourages them in their, she encouraged them in their apostolic labors and comforted them in their sufferings and persecutions. Together, the Holy Spirit and Mary brought Christ into the world. And today, it remains the Holy Spirit and Mary to who together form Christ in us. Holiness is nothing other than likeness with Christ, and it is Mary and the Holy Spirit who thus mold us. The Holy Spirit carries out this mission, our sanctification in union with Mary. Now, this will be the last question. Now, how will this mystical reproduction be brought about in soul? How does this mystical reproduction brought by the Holy Spirit, how does it happen in soul? It is in the same way in which Jesus was brought into the world, for God gave, gives a wonderful mark of, un, of unity in his work. The church teaches us regarding Jesus, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. That is the way Jesus is always conceived. That is the way he is reproduced in souls. So if, so if you have devotion to Mary, when we pray the rosary, we're faithful in praying the rosary, we, every time we pray the rosary and we, and, and, and we allow the Holy Spirit to take charge of our life, he begins, and when he sees Mary, his spouse in our heart, he begins to transform us into Christ. Christ is born into, in our hearts. 
Christ grows within us. And the more Christ grows, we're conformed into his likeness. The Holy Spirit chose to make us, chose to make use of the Blessed Lady, although he had no absolutely need of her, in order to become actively fruitful in producing Jesus and his members in her and by her. This is a mystery of grace, unknown even to many of the most learned and the spiritual Christians. Two artisans must concur in the, wor- in, in the work, the Holy Spirit and the Most Virgin Mary. Two sanctifiers are necessary to, to the souls, the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, for they are the only ones who can reproduce Christ. God the Holy Spirit, who does not produce any divine person, became fruitful through Mary, whom he espoused. It was with her, in her, and of her that he produced his masterpiece, God made man, and that he produces every day until the end of the world, the members of the body of this adorable head. For this reason, the more he finds Mary, his dear and inseparable spouse in the soul, the more powerful and effective he becomes in producing Jesus Christ in that soul and that soul in Jesus Christ. This is a quote from St. Louis de Montfort. These two, then, the Holy Spirit and Mary, are indispensable artificers of Jesus, the indispensable sanctifiers of soul. The action of the Holy Spirit and the cooperation of the Most Virgin Mary are constant. Without them, no one single character of Jesus would be traced on our souls. No virtue grow no gift developed, no grace increase, no bond of union with God be strengthened in the rich flowering of, the, of this uh, spiritual life. So I'll just end by saying, next time when you pick up the rosary, always invoke the Holy Spirit. And when you invoke the Holy Spirit, ask our Blessed Mother to dispose you to receive him, to be open to him, as she did. Ask our Blessed Mother to exchange her eyes with yours so you could see Christ, the one you ponder in the, in the rosary. Ask our Blessed Mother to unite your heart with hers to love Christ as you ponder the word. Ask our Blessed Mother to unite your ears with hers to listen to the Holy Spirit. And ask our Blessed Mother to totally give your whole being to her, to, I mean, to her so that All she does is present you to the blessed Trinity.